sound is a better quality and blah, 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 blah. But anyway, um, if you've noticed, they come with these big jackets, these big dust covers, big album covers. And uh, I would argue that a lot of those are, uh, are pieces of art. And, and so much so that in my home, in my living room, I have a bunch of them on the wall because they're just beautiful pieces of art. And every once in a while, I'll catch myself just kind of walking through my living room like an art gallery and just looking at these vinyl covers and just finding the little intricacies within the artwork, even with listening to music or not listening to music. Now, that's the thing. I can always keep going back to something that's so familiar over and over and over in finding new nuances, finding new little things that are happening within it, throw the record on, and then you can hear like new nuances in that. And I would call a lot of them masterpiece. They're an absolute masterpiece. They continue to create, create awe for me each and every time I go back to it. They reveal the pure genius of the creator of the music and of the artwork as well. I'd argue that this is true, even more true about the Lord's Prayer within the Bible. Maybe when I say the Lord's Prayer, you say, hey, I know that by heart, maybe a little different vernacular. Maybe you've never heard of the Lord's Prayer at all. Maybe when you hear the Lord's Prayer or you recite the Lord's Prayer, it brings you great comfort. Maybe sometimes when you hear the Lord's Prayer or recite the Lord's Prayer, it reminds you kind of a, a ritualistic, maybe religious past as well, not saying it necessarily bad as well. But regardless, the Lord's Prayer is a piece of art that we can keep going back to and nuancing over and over and over. It's one of the most concise, encouraging, and simple prayers ever uttered, but make sure you don't allow its simplicity to lull you into missing its power, its beauty, its depth, and its height. Now, during the six weeks of Lent, which we're in right now, we're going to just meander and take our time and walk through the Lord's Prayer just line by line. And one of the things of during the season of Lent, the church historically would have increased prayer. Increased times of prayer. And so we're going to use this Lent season to pray more together. So not only are we going to learn together about the Lord's Prayer, and as, I, as we teach from here the Lord's Prayer, but we're also going to read it together. We're going to pray it together. We're going to practice it together. We're even going to sing it together. We're going to be all just immersed in the Lord's Prayer during this season. Now, where is the Lord's Prayer? Well, if you've got a Bible, it's in the New Testament in the book of Matthew, Chapter 6 of Matthew. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay, but you're going to need one here because we lead from the Bible, teach from the Bible. We love our Bibles. And so at Center Point, we have English and, St and Spanish versions that are free. We just love to give you one as a gift to you. We also will put the, the scripture on the screen for you. And then we have the Grace Point Vegas app that is free, and it has a whole Bible on there as well. That way you can be in God's Word with us. Um, now, the Lord's Prayer is found nestled down in the middle of a sermon, and the sermon is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And the preacher of the sermon, which I'd argue is the best preacher ever, it was Jesus. So there you go. So Jesus, he shows his disciples, shows us how to pray. Now, interesting, I love the way Jesus teaches a lot of times. If you watch some of Jesus' teaching, how he teaches us different things in life, especially on this prayer, he teaches us what not to do. He says, don't do it this way, but do it that way. So what had happened was, and you'll look through um, the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5 through 7, you'll see this phrase over and over and over. Jesus will say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Which he's basically saying, everyone is saying this, word on the street is this. You maybe uh, have heard it said this way, but I say to you, it's this way. He's, like, he's basically saying, they got it wrong. Let me straighten it out for you, is what he's saying. And so... Um, I, I want to show you at the beginning, the, in the context, what's going on before this, this sermon of Je Jesus, this prayer that he's teaching us. I, and I, my prayer for, for us is that this would be a big deal for us. This would, this would really open our eyes and our hearts uh, to want to commune with our Father more, to want to, to talk with God, to be with God, because maybe the reason why we, we suffer with prayerlessness is because maybe we're doing it wrong. So let's look at what he says. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. I pray this is freeing for us. He says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. That's one of the things we hate to be called, right? No one here says, I love being called a hypocrite. No, we hate that. He says, don't be like hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at street corners, and that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Their reward. 
But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, real quick, Jesus is not really talking about proximity there and space as well. Uh, It's okay to pray publicly. It's okay to pray privately. He's more talking about the heart motive behind your prayer. And so he tells us one way to not do it is like that of a hypocrite. Now, a hypocrite is simply someone who is acting. A hypocrite would be known as an actor, someone who puts on a mask. And he's like, don't just go out and act like you're super spiritual or super religious so other people will see you and they'll think, man, that guy or man, that gal, they are really religious. They are really spiritual, whatever. He said, if that is your point in praying publicly like that, he says, then you just got your reward, impressing people. And for lack of better words, whoopie doo. I mean, like, big deal, right? It's not a big deal. So he says, don't do that. I always think about when it comes to my prayer with God, I I want prayer with God to to be normal, natural. I want to have set times where I sit down and and have quiet time, if you will, with him. I want to have times where I'm just thinking in my mind and praying to Jesus. And and I kind of had this this picture in my mind of when I die, I die now, and then boom, I wake up before the Lord, and we just pick up where we left off. You know, I might say something to Jesus like, you know, hey, how's it going? Like, man, huh, you're a little taller than I thought, or hey, you're a little darker than what the Renaissance paintings made you out to be, or America made you out to be, but hey, it's good to see you, man. I want it to be natural and flowing, not die here and wake up and be like, oh, hey, Jesus, it's been a while, hasn't it? I, you know, and not know him. And what he's talking about is that we would be hypocrites like, like we don't know. We don't know who we, we don't talk to him like we know him. He says, don't do that. Don't do that. Verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, which Gentile in that time period were non-Jews. Okay? Don't pray like they do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. It's the idea that many people throughout history, many religions, many different things, they would just pray and there would be a lot of repetition within prayer. And the idea was, if I can pray the right things, pray the right ways, do the right types of prayer things, then I can manipulate God. And if I can manipulate God, I can get God to do whatever I want him to do. For instance, you remember back in, there's a story in the Old Testament about a guy by the name of Elijah. And Elijah is having a showdown with the prophets of Baal. And Baal was a false god at the time. And so they're basically having this God showdown. He's like, you guys go first. And he's like, you need to conjure up your God and get him to strike down fire. And so what do they do? They try to pray and pray and pray to their false god. Nothing happens. And then they start running around. They start amping it up. They start getting really loud. Then they start to cut themselves, try to incite their God. And and then Elijah, being a good dude, starts to do a little trash talking with them. Is your God asleep? Is your God in the restroom? Like, what's wrong with your God kind of deal? And then Elijah just he basically says, hey, God, call it down. And God goes, boom, brings the, brings the heat. He said, no, we don't need, we, there's no like this, this secret code that we feel like we have to pray at times to crack this code to get God to do what we want him to do. If we're not careful, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of do that as well. Maybe within our prayers, we were very repetitious. Maybe we say Father God about a thousand times. Father God this, Father God that, Father God this. And like, it's like we think if we say enough, of, or we'll start saying in Jesus' name. Not, just, not at the end of the prayer, in the prayer. Because you know, like when we start saying in Jesus' name in the middle of the prayer, like we're serious about this prayer. And if we're not careful, we think if we just keep saying these phrases, it's kind of like, you ever watch the movie Beetlejuice? It's kind of like Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. If I say it enough, then it'll show up kind of deal. And it, just think when we pray, if we're in Christ, we're Christians. When we pray, I mean, it's not like a, a code we have to crack. We have a relationship with God because of all Christ has done on our behalf. Even the Bible says that Jesus is, is, is mediating for us. Even says when we don't have words to say, when it's just like, ah, when we, don't, we have nothing to say, the Holy Spirit is like pushing that forward for us. That's the good news. And so... We don't have to use a whole lot of words because we cannot manipulate God. We don't have to be babblers. I love what our old preacher friend Solomon says in Ecclesiastes. He says it like this. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore... Let your words be few, for a dream comes with much business, 
and a fool's voice with many words. Augustine, the great man of old, said it like this. Remove from prayer much speaking, not much praying. So Jesus is saying, don't do that. Don't be a hypocrite like you do not know God. Don't just be acting for people to see for spiritual consumption for everyone to like, man, that's a spiritual dude right there. And he says, don't be a babbler. Don't, like God already knows what you need. Just, just go to him in relationship. Not trying all these flowery words and these little codes to try to crack God to manipulate him. He will not be manipulated. He is God. So what do we do? Well, Jesus doesn't just tell us what not to do. He does us a solid and says, this is how you should pray. Look at verse 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, just that one line, I want to just point to two, two points of emphasis right here. I want to draw our attention to two things right here just in our time this morning. The first thing is this, the name. Did you notice the name right here? Jesus instructs us to call God our Father. In every mention of Jesus praying to God, he calls him Father in the New Testament all but one. Now, for us in this time period of history and cultural uh, 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 Christianity, it's pretty normal for us to call God Father. It still is at this point, but it always wasn't that way. That's, that's something you know, from Jesus on. You look in the Old Testament, God is really not referred to as father by his people. Now, you can see he has fatherly tendencies. You can talk about Israel being his children and all that, but you don't see people really praying to him as this father. And, and father is communicating something. Father is communicating a closeness. Father is communicating intimacy. But here's what I know. Here's the reality. I know it may be extremely difficult for many of you here to call God father. Why? Because that's probably where your greatest life wounds have come from. I mean, that's why we call it daddy issues or daddy wounds. When you think of your father, you think of like, that's the person who left. That was the person who was never there. That was the person that hurt me the most. That was the person that was mean and cruel to me. That was the person that always broke his promises no matter what. That was the person that violated me, that hurt me emotionally, mentally, and even physically. Listen, your father is not our father. Our father is not the father who hurt you. See, we, we must be able to dis discern from the two. And, and I want to help us. I, and if, this, this might be all of us a bit. I want to help us discern from the two. Let, let, me, let me help you do this. When, when Jesus referred to God as our father, Jesus was indicating this profound sense of intimacy that he himself had with God. He was showing us that he has this unique relationship with God the Father because Jesus, the Bible tells us, is his only begotten son. So left alone, we are not, or left alone, we cannot call God our Father. Listen to me. You might want to hold your head on this because your brain may explode, but I'm going to tell you something. It's going to be very, very tough. We are not all children of God. Just, hear, just before you, you know, start throwing tomatoes at me, hang on. We, we are not all, all children of God. I, I know what you've heard on the radio. I know what you've read in books, what you've seen on TV. I know what the shack told you. I got it. I got it. But that's what, what, what you've been told about everyone is just children of God is, is theologically and biblically inaccurate. It's inaccurate. Just because we are human beings doesn't mean that we are automatically children of God. Creations of God, yes. Created in the image of God. And since we're created in the image of God, we have dignity and value and worth and meaning and significance. We are the crown jewel of God's creation. We have love of God, absolutely. But we're not children of God automatically. Jesus, if you want to see a funny fight that Jesus has with the Pharisees, the really religious people of the New Testament, if you want to see an interesting fight, just a, Jesus was such a wordsmith, and there's a little sarcasm in there as well. But in John chapter 8, he's having this kind of verbal sparse with them. And one time, he just looks at him, kind of throws it down like, your dad is the devil. I mean, them's this fighting words where I'm from. <laughs> I was like, come on now. Let's, I mean, but, but he even says that. Paul, Paul in Ephesians, this is what he says about us before then. In Ephesians 2, 1, he says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins, in which you were once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once, all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature 
children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. The Bible says that's without Christ, this is what we are, children of wrath, sons of disobedience, all of us. R.C. Sproul says it this way, when the Bible speaks of the fatherhood of God, it doesn't characteristically do so with regard simply to creation, but specifically to redemption. He's not talking about, when the Bible talks about children of God, it's not because of creation, it's because of redemption, because of all that Christ has done. Since that is the case, the fatherhood of God is not inclusive, but exclusive and restricted. Boy, that'll mess your 2018 sensibilities up real quick, huh? So what's the difference? What's the difference? I'll give you one word. You can say Jesus, absolutely. But I'll give you one word under that that makes sense within all this. How do, we, how do we call God our Father? Adoption. Adoption. That's all we got. The only way we can accurately call God our Father is by being adopted as a child through the payment of his only son applied by the Holy Spirit. That's it. I don't know if you know anything about adoption, but adoptions are very, very expensive nowadays, aren't they? Your adoption into the family of God was the most expensive thing ever, the perfect, innocent blood of Jesus. That's the only thing that'll pay for it. And that's how we call him Father. You see, when he gave his disciples this prayer, he invited them to use this intimate name of the Father because they were adopted in. This is not something that we take lightly. This is not something that we kind of pass over like, yeah, God's our Father. That's what he's got to do, and that's what I got to do. It's bigger than that. It's profound. It's life-changing. This ours, when he says our Father, reveals this idea that we have this possession of God, that God is ours. Not that we own God, not that we can manipulate God, but we're in this relationship. He's our Father. Like, really? Not just in like Sunday morning kind of deal, but all of life and all of eternity, God is our Father. Jesus has given us what is his now, this unique relationship with God. Now the Father identifies with us because he identifies with Jesus as his son. Now we, because of Christ, can be called sons and daughters, that we have God as our Father. See, nothing shapes our life more and our prayer more than the words, our Father. We know who we're going to. We have a relationship, if you're in Christ, with the one we go to. I mean, think about it. No wonder we don't pray if we don't understand him as our Father. I mean, if God is impersonal, then why would we pray? If God is fickle like some of our earthly fathers, well, then no wonder we don't go to him. If God is against us, well, why would we go to him in prayer? If we see God as Santa Claus, he's making a list, he's checking it twice, he's going to find out who's naughty or nice. If he's like that, that's not grace. Why in the world would we go to him? Ah, oh, he's much gracious, more gracious than that. He's a good father. He is our father. And the only way that that's possible is the gospel. And the gospel informs us about this. When we say our father, the gospel informs us, this good news of Christ, that Jesus came and lived the life that we could never live of perfection, obedient to the father completely. That Jesus died on the cross where we should have been and we should have died for eternity upon. He paid that penalty for us. That Jesus didn't stay down like we would have and will. Jesus got back up and so we will as well in him. It's the gospel informs us of all this. So he fulfilled what was necessary to reconcile us with God. And so when God sees us, when God listens to us, it's, it's as if his only begotten son is speaking or, or going before us. That we have the same rights as the son now. That's really good news. We can call him our father. See, that's, the gospel is not that Jesus just came and told people to stop sinning. That's not good news. We have the whole Old Testament telling us that, right? No, Jesus came to save sinners and make a way where we can call God our father. He came to save sinners and to do that. And so we are children of God now. We can go to God. Now, some of you may say, well, Ty, that sounds great and all, but you don't know what I did last night. You don't know what I've been doing. You don't, you don't know what's going on in my life. There's no way I can go to God. No way he can forgive me. Listen, if you're in Christ, listen to me. If you are in Christ, you can go to him. Yes, it grieves him. Your sin grieves God. Don't ever mistake that. But he loves you, and he's a forgiving God. Just like when your kids sin, it grieves you, right? Let me try one more time. Just like when your kids sin, it grieves you, right? Do you still love them? And God is perfect father. Perfect. Look, look what Hebrews 4 says. I love this. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. 
Hold fast to that good news. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted. Jesus has been tempted in every respect of a human, yet without sin. Marvel at Jesus there. Let us then with confidence, with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of needs. Jesus was saying that not only he was allowed to address God as Father by virtue of his unique status as the Son of God, but even his followers now have the privilege by virtue to address God as Father. So this is a big deal. If we're adopted, sons and daughters, because of Christ, because of, the, of, of, of his name that we call him Father, dramatically changes everything about us. Changes everything. There's a, I have a litany list of what the Bible says about you now. If you have been adopted by the Father, you have trusted Christ and his work on the cross for you, here's what you need to hear. And I'm gonna read through a bunch of them really fast. And these are from the Bible that says the scripture beside it. You can take a picture of it if you need. The Bible says this is true of you because it's true of Christ. The Bible says this is true of you. You gotta hear this. If you're a son or daughter, be encouraged by God's word today because he is our Father. Watch this. I am a child of God. I am a friend of Jesus. I have been justified and redeemed. My old self was crucified with Christ. I am no longer a slave to sin. I will not be condemned by God. I have been set free from the law of sin and death. As a child of God, I am a fellow heir with Christ. I have been accepted by Christ. I have been called to be a saint. In Christ Jesus, I have wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. My body is a temple that the Holy Spirit dwells in me. I am joined to the Lord and am one spirit with him. God leads me in the triumph and knowledge of Christ. I am a new creature in Christ. I have become the righteousness of God in Christ. I have been made one with all who are in Christ Jesus. We have a family now. I am no longer a slave, but a child and an heir. I have been set free in Christ. I am chosen, holy, and blameless before God. I am redeemed and forgiven by the grace of Christ. I have been predestined by God to obtain an inheritance. I have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Because of God's mercy and love, I have been made alive with Christ. I am seated in the heavenly places of Christ. I am God's workmanship created to produce good works. I have been brought near to God by the blood of Christ. I am a member of Christ's body and a partaker of his promise. I have boldness and confident access to God through faith in Christ. My new self is righteous and and holy. I was formerly darkness, but now I am light in the Lord. I am a citizen of heaven. The peace of God guards my heart and mind. God supplies all my needs. I have been made complete in Christ. I I have been raised up with Christ. My life is hidden with Christ in God. Christ is my life, and I will be revealed with him In glory, I have been chosen of God and am holy and beloved. God loves me and has chosen me. That's the good news that God says about you since he is our father. He has the power to to rename you and give you this new identity. And so that's why it's so important for us to begin with this, God, that Jesus would say our father. The question is, if you're not in Christ This is not true of you. This is not true of you. But I have really good news for you. God is in the adoption business. Everyone here that this is true of, they didn't earn it. They didn't work for it. They didn't deserve it. And yet God adopted them. And so if you want this to be true of you, you want to to say with accuracy, God, you are my father. Trust Jesus. Give Jesus your life. On your way in, you notice a cross out there by the doors. Like at the end of our gathering today, there'll be men and women out there that would love to introduce introduce you to Jesus to where you can rightfully say, God is my father. I have been redeemed by Christ. I am a son. I am a daughter. This is my family for now and for eternity. That's the good news of the gospel. We are his sons and daughters. He's our father. But even as we talk about the name we refer to uh, God by, this leads us to the second emphasis. Not only is Jesus emphasizing this name that that God would be our father, but also the nature of God. Look back at verse 9. He says, pray like this. Our father in heaven, hallowed 
be your name. Now, the phrase in heaven uh, points us to the reality that God may be as intimate and close to us as this father, but he's also majestic and highly exalted. And he uses this word here. We really don't use this word because I remember when I first started reading this word, I'm like, hallowed? What does hallowed mean? Hallowed, you got to add a little extra emphasis. Hallowed simply means to make holy. Hallowed be your name, to make holy God's name. So does that mean that we're, we, we have to kind of muster up a whole lot of, you know, trying to make God holy that way he can be holy? Oh, no, no, no. God is way holy without us. Like, it's not that, that he needs us to make him holy. He is holy. When you look back at the book of Isaiah, when, when um, Isaiah has this you know, vision of God, God is before him, and the only thing Isaiah can say, which we read earlier, is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then, boom, he hits the floor. And he says, whoa, I'm a man of uncleanness. Not like the 90s blossom, like, whoa, but I mean, like, like whoa, a man of unclean lips. You are holy, I'm not. You are high and majestic, I'm low and detestable. So God is holy. Yes, he's intimate like a father. Yes, he's close in that nature. But he is transcendent, which just means God is otherworldly. He, he's not like us in that way. He's, he is God. He is contained and controlled by nothing. He is limitless. He is high and lifted up, majestic and holy. Holy, he's good, right, and perfect all the time. There's no deceit, no evil, no sin in him. He's perfect. Now, this prayer, Jesus wants us to begin our prayers by addressing the name who God is, who we're talking to, and his holiness. That's where the priority begins, I believe. The line says, hallowed be your name. Now, what we're doing is, as we walk through this whole prayer, there's petitions within the prayer. There, what we're asking for, requests. We understand what petitions are, right? If you don't like the way something is, say you're at school, and you don't like the way the hamburgers taste, you get all your friends together, you get a clipboard, you get a bunch of white paper out, and you get everybody to sign these things. They're like, we don't like hamburgers. We want Taco Bell instead. And then, you know, lunch lady looks at it, and she's like, no, whatever. Or like, you know, there's a law of the land or something going on you don't like. You get lots of people to sign something so you can make change. It's a request. And so this is our first request. This is our first petition. Jesus is informing us disciples, this should be our first petition, request of our prayer, what we should prioritize. The first thing he told them to pray about is that God, his name, would be regarded as holy, not common. His name would be weighty, the weightiness of all of our lives and the universe. That's what he's saying right here. Not only to us, but it starts with us, but it goes to us as a church community. It goes to the whole world that we would say, God, make your name known as holy throughout the whole world. May your name and your reputation be holy, be weighty to all people everywhere at all times. That's what this request is right here. But this is where we go sideways in our prayers sometimes. I believe this is where I, this is, we all kind of go sideways when it comes to asking God to make his name holy in our lives, the lives of our church and the lives of the world. Look, look back here. He says, verse 9, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Names are important, right? Your name is very, very important. It's how people know you. They know you by your name. Well, God's name is very, very important as well. So much so in the Old Testament one of the big 10, the 10 commandments, he says this in Exodus 20, verse seven, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You think about replace and repeal, that one didn't happen with that one because Jesus is confirming it even more in the Lord's prayer right here. God places a very high premium on the importance of people recognizing his name and his nature, his holiness, and treating it as such. See, even in the Old Testament times, they wouldn't even write down his name Yahweh. They were afraid they would botch it, mess it up, not pronounce it right or not write it right. And so they wouldn't even like mess with his perfect name. And Jesus is repeating this instruction. Um, names are important. I, I, I have a very odd name. Most of you probably know me by Ty, T-Y, but that's not my name. My name is actually Tyron T. Y-R-I-N. So you are right. My mom and dad were hippies, and so they just made up a name. 
Surprised I didn't get like Moonbeam or something like that. But it happened. Um, I, I researched it uh, a while back on Google. You know Google's always right. So my name uh, is from Africa, land of the noble. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, but here's what happens to me all the time. People butcher my name all the time. I get Tyler. I get Todd. I get Tyron. I get Tryon. I don't know how to come. My middle initial is A. I get Tyrena, and then they see I'm a dude. They're like, oh, uh, one of my best friends calls me Tyrone. I love this hair. I get called all kinds of things. Um, but I honestly, outside of just playful, friendly banter, um, I, I get kind of, I feel kind of slighted when people, when people don't get my name right. Sometimes people will look at it, look at me, look at it, look at me, and they'll be like, yeah, you did it. And that kind of deal. <laughs> What's even worse is sometimes, believe it or not, people will misrepresent me and say I said something or I did something or I act like something and misrepresent me. And I really, really don't like it when people don't get my name right or misrepresent me. Now, you don't like that either, do you? Multiply that by infinity when it comes to a holy God. By infinity. That we would get his name and nature wrong. That we would not call him for who he is. That we would not see him for who he is. Yeah, Ty, you know, I call God, God, and I got his nature right when I pray and all that. Maybe you do. Man, that's great. But I think we go a little sideways on this sometimes. What does your prayer sound like? What does your prayer look like? Some of you say, well, Ty, I don't pray. Okay, great. Let's let's use that as a starting point. Let's, Let's move the needle just a little bit before you help you start to pray. But he says, make his name hallowed. I was recently listened to a message uh, on the Lord's Prayer from uh, a guy by the name of Russ Moore. He's a theologian, ethicist, and preacher. He currently works as the president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission in Washington, D.C., doing a profound work, prolific writer, good dude. He says, if we don't intentionally strive to make God's name holy within our prayers and within our life, he said, this is what we do. We end up using God. We end up using God. He describes it. He said, we construct a God who agrees with us all the time. He agrees with everything I believe all the time. He aspires for me all the things I aspire for. A God who he'll smite all of my enemies. And he's doing some smiting and smoting, whichever you want to do. And he's a God who's okay with everything I'm okay with. And this this is what he says. He said, that's not a holy self-revealing God. That is an idol that we have constructed for ourselves. Tim Keller says it like this. If your God never disagrees with you, you might just be worshiping an idealized version of yourself. That, that's got to be a part of taking the Lord's name in vain. Uh, that we're calling on him and we're speaking on his behalf something he has never said in his word or something contrary to what he has said in his word. Or at least we're not making it holy. And our prayer is like, God, may we make your name holy. As best we can, we're finite creatures. We don't have it all. We, like, we, like, sometimes we just don't get it, but as best we can from his word, may we make your name holy in our lives and in the world around us. See, our, our prayers and our lives must be shaped by that we call him our father, that we have this relational quality all because of what Christ has done. And that we see his nature, that he is holy. And so our petition, our prayer, our request is like, God, make your name holy in my life, in the life of our little family here at Grace Point Church, and in the life of the world around us. God, make your name holy. God's name and nature refer to God as he is, not as what we want him or dream him or what's convenient and comfortable for us to be. Perhaps looking in his name and nature, maybe some of us will be honest, like, you know, I really, I really don't, I really have been apathetic towards God, really kind of been flippant towards prayer and just toward God, not, not seeing him as holy and, and seeing him as this majestic, high and lifted up God, maybe just a lackluster prayer life, or maybe a non-existent prayer life. And so our prayer during the season of Lent is we really dive down into the Lord's prayer is that we would be a people of prayer, and we would be a people of prayer that where we really do call on the name of God because, because we have relationship with him because of all Christ has done. And that we would really see him as who he is, God, not like us, but he's, he's God. And so I think it would be utter foolish for us to just preach on the Lord's prayer and not actually pray it together. And, and so, so what I want to do is, 
I want us to, to, to take some significant amount of time together as a family here at Grace Point Church. And some of you may be first-time guests. You may be new. You may be not, not a follower of Jesus. This might be a great way to observe Christians, sons and daughters of the Father pray. might be an opportunity for you to begin to pray as well. But we're going to s- spend some time together praying. And, and what I'm going to do during this, I'm going to give us four kind of movements of prayer. That way we pray together. I'll do some prayer prompts, and then we'll pray together at the end. And and so to begin with, I I want us to pray a prayer that uh, we wrote, um, and and may this be honest of our hearts as well. So let's let's prepare prepare ourselves for prayer. You'll see the uh, the prayer on the screen, and uh, I'm going to try my best to lead us in this. And then in a moment, we're going to look at the nature of God through the Scripture, and I'll prompt us in prayer that as well. So let's pray together. 